first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming. Some people from very far away, like Kyoto and Chiba and uh, all over the place. Uh, so, and we've even got a wonderful high school student with us who is going to hopefully at some point share her perspective on technology and a few other things about learners. So um, uh, with that, I'll get started. And uh, as usual, I'd like to uh, thank so many people uh, who have been helping in a variety of ways uh, clear up my thinking about how leadership plays out in Japan. Um, and also a special thanks to a few people back home. Uh, and let me see if I can say this correctly. Akimashite, omedetou gozaimasu. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, did everyone have a good New Year? Yeah. Yes, anyone want to share anything fun? Rest. <laughs> 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 Rest. Lots of rest. rest. <laughs>
uh, Best Evidence in Medical Education put out a nice little review um, uh, that had looked at this very issue. And they really found what, what we're finding here, which is very few physicians and very few people who are leaders in healthcare actually have real leadership training. Okay? So the, the big message here is this. Okay? If we believe an activity is critical and that the outcome is important, then some kind of training in that area to some desired level of competency is probably important. Okay? And so um, just uh, uh, this week, we began a um, teaching scholars program for the University of Tokyo. And the focus of it, uh, Wisconsin Sensei's Health, um, has been on leadership. And so we're going to do about eight sessions, about four hours each, um, focusing on leadership and leadership projects and development and curriculum and evaluation and things along those lines. But we had kind of a brainstorming of 16 of the educational leaders in uh, Todai uh, to talk about what they thought was important uh, for the Japanese population of healthcare needs. And so many things came up. You know, of course, we're all aware of the aging of the population. Um, but not only the aging of the population, people are working longer and harder. That's leading to a deterioration of the traditional family structure where we think that people can take care of themselves, can, can take care of each other in groups quite well. So the rising isolationism plus the multimorbidity. Is that term familiar in, uh, in English, multimorbidity? People who have more than one complex problem that needs to be taken care of will lead to a need, not just for specialists, but also we're going to have um, uh, a shrinking population base. And because of that, uh, the need to be able to get people, good people into healthcare, the competition is going to be even more stiff for people who are talented. Okay. The um, uh, economy has been shrinking a little bit, and healthcare financing is also under extreme duress. Right? And on top of it, we know that we have to plan for disasters because natural disasters are going to happen. And that, too, is going to stress us. And as we think about creating healthcare systems that can respond to all of these needs, we also have to think about this, which is, um, so this is the, um, I, I put, uh, I have picture slides and then I have some word slides after that to make it easier to follow for people who are, uh, who's, uh, uh, since I can't speak Japanese particularly well. So um, there's also very positive disruptive factors happening in medicine, right? So a big thing is that we're having the rise of personalized medicine, the rise of genomic medicine. We'll be able to tailor therapy to people quite well. Information technology has provided us a wealth of information, right? Um, our prevention techniques are better than they've ever been. Uh, global medicine has made a difference in some positive ways, like we can share resources. Negative ways, because we're getting everybody else's diseases, right? Uh, like how many of us have seen dengue fever recently? Okay. Okay. That's a lot of it. Um, We've got new care delivery methods, mid-level providers are having no more roles. We're having all kinds of new delivery systems. And uh, there's all kinds of things. We don't even know what's going to happen in the future, but we have to create healthcare systems and educational systems that are prepared for whatever comes. And that's a big paradigm shift from the doctor carrying their bag, you know, seeing the patient down the street, and then taking care of them one on one. We're talking about massive systems that we have to create and we have to train people to be able to uh, work at them. So does that make sense to you for, in terms of the need for why we need to think about leadership training? Yes, kind of? Yes, no? I'm seeing some yeses. I hope more yeses than noes. So one of the big things is this, right? So our healthcare system, because of globalization and all the things that we've talked about, are going through major disruptions. And disruption technologies are a little bit hard to think about just in medicine. So I'm going to give you an example from the hotel industry. Okay. Um, in the hotel industry, so this is based on Clay Christensen's work at Harvard, who uh, wrote this book, Innovator's Prescription, uh, three, four years ago. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to read it, please do. It's a very good book. Okay. What Clay said is this, is that if you look at time and you look at quality of any product, and let's take the hotel industry now, there's going to be people who are at the high end of the market, and they want the best of everything. Okay? There's going to be some people, and those are the people who are going to be staying at the Four Seasons and the Ritz Carlton and the Mandarin Oriental. And then you're going to have some people who are going to be very fine with the budget hotels. Okay? So when an industry is first starting, it's going to start at the base. It's going to start kind of probably a little bit above the low end, but all the money is in the high end. So they're going to go for the high end of the market. 
And these people, as they become better and better, will become market leaders. Okay. On the other hand, uh, at some point in time, however, and, these, this, and for a long time, the market leaders look like they'll be the only ones who will be able to survive in this market. Okay. However, something else is going to happen, which is a disruptive technology is going to come out. And initially, it's going to start like this, right over here at the base. And this is going to be, for a hotel industry, it's Airbnb. Are you familiar with that uh, program, Airbnb? No? It's a technology platform that allows you and me to rent out our houses or to rent out our spare rooms when we're there, when we're not there, and anybody can use it. Okay? So all of a sudden, if I'm gone for a week and I want to run out my apartment, I can do that and much, much lower than the high-end places and probably lower than the budget hotels. Now, my apartment in uh, Bunkyo Q, let me turn this on. Um, my apartment in Bunkyo Q is pretty cute, but it's certainly no, no Four Seasons. And um, uh, anyone who's looking to stay at the Four Seasons is not going to be staying in my house. Okay? However, what's happened is as Airbnb became more and more well-known, people like my friends who own vineyards and have $10 million houses are starting to rent out their houses too. Now all of a sudden, the people who were at the low end of the market, the same technology is moving to the high end of the market, and those the technology has become disruptive. Okay? So in medicine, we're seeing disruptive technologies all the time. Things that were very high cost are now becoming very low cost. We can do blood, uh, bedside hemoglobin A1Cs and all kinds of things that were unthinkable, uh, bedside ultrasounds, unthinkable a couple years ago. Right? And all of our information technology is changing the way we practice. So the reason I bring this up is because I will posit that up until about 10 years ago, there were no disruptions, uh, disruptive innovations in medicine since the advent of the printing press, which was the first big disruption in education, when information could be shared beyond just one um, sensei in one place. So this is major because for decades and decades, for like hundreds of years, we've done medicine and we've taught the same way. Okay? It's been in small groups, it's been people coming to a university and learning. But now we have something completely different. And information is freely available. Having information freely available changes the mix because we are not the only experts anymore. Okay? Anybody can go out and get information from whatever their favorite data source is, if it's curated, and curated information is now available, meaning high quality, good information is available. Now putting it in perspective and having synthesis and collaboration and knowing how to interpret things, that still is within our provenance, but maybe not in 15 years, we don't know. Okay? And the other thing that's changed in education is massive open online courses. When Catherine Lucy at UCSF developed a clinical decision-making course and put it on um, edX, which is the big joint collaboration between MIT and UCSF and Harvard. Um, they ha she had 600,000 people sign up for it. Okay? They didn't all finish it, but they all signed up and at least had a flavor of it. So um, decision support also, are you guys familiar with the number robot from SoftBank? I know sometimes it is. Um, so the SoftBank robot is actually powered by IBM Watson. So the, the uh, artificial intelligence behind that. And um, uh, IBM, for the past decade, has been working on a program called Dr. Watson, um, which does clinical decision support. And it's actually quite, quite right. Um, uh, and so this is sort of peppered as the vanguard into Japan. They had to come up with a whole new system for, for the Japanese kanji and everything else. But it's an emotive robot. And um, they're experimenting now, IBM is, with methods to be able to help us uh, make better decisions uh, just by voice recognition. So I want to show you um, the learner of the future, which might be Marie, like our medical student, our uh, soon to be medical student. Do you recognize me? Very soon I will be your student. But I will not always sit in your classroom. I will not take out a pencil or open a textbook. You grew up with books. I grew from a laptop, an iPad, a smartphone. You guys here? I use a keyboard more than a pen. I am a digital native, an active learner. Why can't I just a textbook when my iPad connects me to the world? I want to know things all the time, and right away. 
maybe the best place for cool shoes or where to hike the Himalayas. To learn, I look online because the classroom isn't enough for me. Not when I can see faces, hear voices, and chat with people on the other side of the world. I want to learn about Chinese history from someone in Beijing. My school has to keep up with me, not the other way around. I have more and more choices. When you were my age, no one had heard of a charter school. No one could imagine a virtual school. But it's projected that by 2019, half of all high school courses will take place online. I use mobile devices to connect with friends, classmates, and teachers. And when I'm more connected, I'm more interested. I don't buy music at a store or movies or books. I get them instantly online. And when they excite me, I share with friends. That's how I want my education to be. I am strong. And when I'm older, I want to keep learning. Do you recognize me? Very soon, I will be changing the world. But I need you. If you're ready to help me, I'll find you. But it's your challenge to keep up with me. I'm a digital native, an active learner. Listen to me. Help me. Together, we can create a future. So, um, does that ring true to you? In terms of what you're seeing and the people that you're working with? Yes? No? Yes, definitely. Got a couple yeses here. Okay. So uh, does that ring true with you? Yeah. Our representative teenager? Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, good. So uh, I wanted to make the point here that leadership training is essential. We have to be able to figure out better ways of meeting our people's needs. And we have to be able to shape our uh, systems. And uh, the competencies for this range all over the place. But the top six that I got from uh, multiple sources are these. The first is leading change. The second is leading people. The third is getting results. Okay. Uh, then a business acumen, building coalitions, and finally professionalism. Okay. These are important ideas for us to do, and we could spend a year on each of them, but we're going to spend an hour on just a few of them. Okay. So now let's get specific. Um, and uh, I wanted to share some kind of. A, a, so uh, let's think about. Does everyone recognize this person over here? Right, this is uh, our veritable Song Sensei, who uh, we, everyone knows him as a fabulous scholar, as quite the mentor, right, as a great educator, and also as someone who is uh, fabulous at patient care, right? He really bonds with his patients. Um, he's been running all kinds of programs here. But what you might not know is that one of his side interests is in, uh, now becoming a major interest, is in empathy and medicine. Right? Did you want to say anything about empathy? <coughs> I'm involved in uh, uh, education for uh, medical students. I'm involved in communication skills training. I'm involved in uh, 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 especially interested in uh, empathy. So empathy, uh, it seems uh, not digital, but uh, in fact it's digital in the application perspective. Yeah. Okay. And, and in fact, you've even done just a fabulous study, and these are, these are hot off the presses uh, data from uh, medical students at two institutions showing that in fact, he, he and his colleagues have been able to teach empathy, and you can document that improvement with OSCEs. Okay. So this is a very big deal, especially in Japan, where communication with patients is an important topic. Right? So now Son Sensei wants to do something. He wants to change the entire Todai curriculum and then change the curriculum for the entire country. And he wants to start at home first. And he wants to get resources, develop a program. He knows he's going to be leading this program. And it's going to be great. He's got very specific ideas about what he wants to do. But before he starts, the first thing he wants to do is kind of understand the lay of the land a bit. So he knows that this is kind of one of the organizational structures of Amazon and Google and Facebook and Oracle and Apple. Um, but he knows that even countries have specific organizational patterns. And then in Japan, uh, there's one that has both hierarchy and it has collaboration. Um, so there's a process that he understands the system pretty well because he's been working in it. But every system and every culture is pretty unique. And I put a few more countries in there just for kicks, but that's not the focus of today, so we're not going to go into detail onto it. And this is from um, uh, a wonderful book in 94 called uh, When Cultures Collide, if you guys have a chance, also a good read. Okay. 
So he's decided that what he's going to do is start with the dean. Because he knows that if he can get the dean on board, then he's going to be in pretty good shape to be able to get people to uh, kind of help him, uh, help himself. And so he starts off by saying first, God, you know, I really want a new program. Doesn't that sound great? I want it to be amazing. And I want all the resources I can possibly have. And then he starts saying, well, you know, I wonder, I wonder. So um, if I go in and just tell the dean exactly what I want, okay, um, what's going to happen? He's got lots of people telling him exactly what they want. In fact, most of his day is spent listening to people asking him for things. He said, that's probably not going to be the best thing if I come in with a fixed position. Maybe I just need to be smarter about it. And you know, he also said, well, maybe if I go talk to a lot of other people and tell them what I want, then they'll kind of agree with me too. But he knows that the more stakeholders are involved, the more difficult it is to going to be, because some people will have very fixed beliefs, they're not going to want exactly what he wants. He says, well, that's not a really great strategy to start off with either. And he said, well, you know, what would happen if I just went and kind of started talking to the dean initially? Um, if I just tell him what I want, I think also the other thing that's going to happen is it's going to endanger our relationship. It's probably going to antagonize him. And it's probably going to be very ineffective. Okay? So he said, that's not the best thing to do. What should I do? He said, well, the dean also has a ton of stressors, right? He's got people uh, from the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health and his faculty and his students and fiscal pressures and all kinds of resource limitations. And we know that budgets are being slashed, but I want to build a new program. What do I do? Okay. So being the scholar that he is, and he said, you know, so just being nice in itself is not an option, right? So being nice isn't going to overcome the fact that the budget is shrinking. That people may like you better, it's very important to be nice and to be respectful and to be kind, but uh, that's not going to be an effective negotiation technique. And he also just doesn't want to give in and say, oh, it's too hard, too big, I can't do it. So um, what he want, he decides to do, being the scholar that he is, as you know, some sensei is quite the scholar, he says, let me get the literature and see what seems to be effective. And he knows that the Harvard Negotiation Project from the uh, 80s, 90s, and 2000s um, with uh, Roger Fisher and Mulyuri had some really good ideas on what to do. Uh, they had four basic principles for how to approach negotiation, right? Um, and is everyone, is anyone familiar with this particular Getting GS book? It's really very classic business book. Okay. So this, again, if you haven't read it, please do. It's a super easy read, um, and uh, uh, you know the, the book doesn't cost very much. There's e-books available. Okay. Yeah, the first thing is to separate the problem from the people. Okay? People, uh, we are not computers. We are not Pepper and the robot. We are emotional people who have fixed ideas, often flexible ideas, about what we believe in and we have core values that are very important to us. So when those things are threatened, we're going to react badly. Okay? So, um, uh, so if you can separate the person and the problem, if you talk about the problem, uh, you know, I, I have a problem regarding this, I wonder if we can think about it together, is a much better way of approaching things than just kind of coming at someone head on. The, the second thing that they really recommend strongly is to focus on mutual interests. Okay? Uh, what's a common goal that you can both achieve together? Okay? And I know this sounds very, very simple, but you would not be, you'll be so unsurprised at how often people do this very badly. And then the third is you want to figure out creative methods for how to do it well together. And so, you know, brainstorm and be creative. Uh, send people material ahead of time. And then finally, you know, instead of saying, well, I, th I think it'll succeed if everyone's happy, right? Well, happiness is a very good measure. It's a, a metric that's used as part of the economic indicators in the Burma, for instance, right? The happiness index uh, for their population. But it, that in itself should not be enough. We should use objective measures and agree on them at the beginning. Because using objective measures, just like you did with your empathy scale, right, fresh off the test data, gets the emotions out of the way and allows you to negotiate much more rationally and from a principled approach. Okay, so um, so what does this look like? So are, are you familiar with this? What, is, what does this look like to you? This is a baseball diamond. Baseball diamond. Who watches baseball? We've got a couple baseball uh, people. Okay. So I, I personally watch no sports, and so I always get all my sports analogies uh, completely wrong. But uh, Bob Keegan at Harvard, uh, who is in the Department of Education, uh, does some really uh, does this in 
So I'm completely borrowing this from him. So thank you, Bob. Um, all right, so uh, this is where I need to get your glasses. Okay, all right. So when I wear the glasses, I'm so sensitive, and then I take them off after being. Do I look like him? Okay. Should I put my hair up? All right. Ah, that didn't work well. All right. So, I don't know what happened there. Oh, okay, it came back. All right. So, I'm Tom Sensei, and um, uh, so, you know, I think it's time for me to go talk to the dean about this project that's very important to me. And uh, I think the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to email him and uh, tell him what I'm looking for. So, uh, dear Dean, um, I hope, you, uh, hope you're well. I just finished a very interesting project related to uh, uh, improving communication with medical students. And uh, uh, I was hoping to talk to you about your viewpoints regarding um, uh, communication with students and what you feel may be issues within the school. was wondering if you wanted to have coffee. Oh my god, another, oh, I can't believe it, I've got yet another meeting request. But you know, this one doesn't seem like they're asking for anything, and I probably can have some coffee. I've got about 10, 15 minutes next week, let me just email him back and see if that works. Great, I've got a meeting. First step, all right, let me uh, not come in with too much material except maybe a one-pager with the key information that I want and then we'll talk about it when we have coffee. So I'll send this to him ahead of time so he at least knows what I'm talking about. Shoo, it's off to the email. So now we're having coffee. I should have put the coffee one too. Okay. So, so Dean, I'm so glad that you could make time to meet with me today. Um, how are you doing? Oh, Swan Sensei, I'm doing quite well, thank you. How are you? Oh, doing great. You know, I just finished this great project with, uh, what, what school was it? Was it uh, Kyoto or? With Shinju. With Shinju? Uh, I just finished this great project with Shinju where we were working with medical students, trying to help them get better uh, at communicating with patients and really understanding their perspective. Oh, how did it go? It sounds, pre it sounds pretty interesting. Well, let me tell you, you know, we were able to show that empathy scores improve when we had, uh, had the students interact with standardized patients. Well, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, I, I, I really thought so too. I thought it was a phenomenal way of trying to get people to think deeply about their interactions with patients. Huh, that sounds pretty interesting. You know, I thought a little bit about that as well. Oh, really? What, what type of things have you thought about? Well, you know, I think one of the problems that Chodai faces is that we have a large heterogeneous population of students who are very young, and they need a little bit of help from us in terms of uh, improving their maturity. Oh, I had the exact same idea. I was wondering if you could tell me more about that. So the conversation goes on for a few minutes. And then at some point in time, after the con because remember, we've only got 10 minutes, um, uh, so and sensei will say, um, you know, uh, I was hoping to see if we could maybe explore ways of making this part of the curriculum. What do you think? And then the dean will say, well, you know, I, I'm not sure. There's so many things on our agenda. This is a pretty long priority list that we have, and I'm not quite sure where this fits on the list. So you're getting resistance. And so on a very wisely says, oh, I completely understand. You know, um, uh, would there be any information that I could send you that might uh, give you some food for thought or maybe we could revisit this in a couple weeks or a month? And the dean says, because it seems like a very easy, reasonable request, the dean says, oh, well, yeah, why don't we meet again in a month or two and, uh, you know, I'll think a little bit about this. And then uh, some sensei will say, is there anything else I can get you in the meantime that might help you think about this a bit more? And the dean will say, well, you know, I think I'm okay for now, but maybe you can send me these three things. Okay. So the meeting is scheduled, a couple months will pass, and uh, so the first, and then during that time period, further discussion will happen. So what Keegan says is that when you're working on something, the first thing to do is you want to be able to agree to meet. Okay? And when you meet and discuss the problem, you're not actually trying to build a program, you're just trying to get buy-in for the idea. And then after that, as you move forward, you follow up with what you promised, you begin at the right time to start discussing additional problems, 
you start getting additional people involved as appropriate, depending on your organizational structure. Thank you so much. With the, um, uh, the I don't know how effective the glass on, glass off is. Um, I should have worn a turtleneck. Uh, and then, uh, um, uh, and then discuss possible solutions, and you kind of keep on going slowly, step by step. It's not a one time I come in with what I want and I get what I want. It's life is never that way, right? It's all a negotiation. And you're only as good as you uh, as what you negotiate. So, you know, several months have passed now, and some sense it's quite happy. Because, you know, he's such a good negotiator, and he is so strategic in his involvement of others at the right time and the right way that he had all kinds of good things. Happen. He got a three-year uh, project grant from Todai, the Ministry of Education, and got a big grant from a nonprofit. Has a hundred million yen now to spend uh, over three years. Three full-time staff, thirty part-time faculty, and oh my God, he's going to be teaching hundred and fifty learners a year. He got not quite everything he wanted. He really wanted double that, but he was pretty happy. Are you happy? <laughs> so he's pretty happy now. Okay. So, so now he's got money, he's got people, and now he has to both lead a program and cre create a program and lead it. Okay? So where does he start? Right? Where does he start? You start by knowing yourself. Okay? The first place you always start is with self-knowledge. Now this is really important because if you don't know yourself as a leader, if you don't know your strengths and weaknesses, the same way if you're a doctor and you don't know that you're good at one procedure and not as good at another, or you, you really need to brush up on this and you're not so good at that, you're going to be not that effective. Okay? So to be a good leader, you first need to know yourself. And let me, uh, I wish Peter Morazan was here, this slide is completely for him. Okay? Uh, who likes to golf? Anyone a big golfer here? So my second sport, are you guys impressed? This is my second sports slide. Yes? All right, if you knew me, you'd be very impressed. I, I'm not a sports person. So why is leadership like golf? And the hint is in the golf clubs. Okay, someone's gotta have an idea, because I can stand here in silence and just The winner uses the fewest strokes. Oh, oh, that's really interesting. I hadn't heard that before. That's great. That's great. Well, if for, for the purposes, first of all, uh, that can often be true. I mean, for, for, the, for golf, it certainly is. For leadership, the, the analogy is actually at the golf clubs, right? So if, uh, if you're trying to go drive something really, really far away, you're not going to use a putter that's meant for, a small, uh, for something that's about five feet away. So depending on the situation, you're going to use a different club. So leadership is like that. You can't use the same tool every single time or else it's going to be ineffective, right? There's a saying in the United States that, that to a hammer, all the world is a nail, right? I, have you heard that saying before? Is there something uh, equivalent in uh, Japan? To the, to the hammer, all the world is a nail, right? All it does is it does that. Wait, wait, huh? The, uh, what was that? <laughs> okay, what does that mean? Now raise the hands that you type with. 
Okay, everybody should be raising both hands if you're typing, you're using both hands. Okay? What this shows us is that although we have a tendency for something, um, we also have great ability to be adaptable. And that adaptability is critical to the way that we engage with the world. Yes. As for right and left, you know, in Asian Greek, Gigo uh, and Dexter. Mm. Yeah. Dexter. Mm. What are the Oftian Eisen? The, the which one? As, as a leadership, what are the Oftian Eisen? As for the death. Yeah, I, I don't quite understand. I'm so sorry. As for the concerning concerning problem with life and death, yeah. optical asthma. Optical right asthma. Right or left. Oh, I'll have to look into that. I don't know. That's do you have a thought about that? Yes. I, I will look into it and then that sounds very interesting. So um uh so the the point I think that you're also perhaps trying to make leadership and the, the problem with death. The leadership and the problem of death? Yes. Mm. Deeply concerned. Well, maybe we can talk about that at the end so we can explore that a little bit a little bit more. Um, uh, so the uh, so one of the things that's important, I think, for, for this is to kind of think about the fact that people who are successful in life, okay, are not just people who have high IQs. High IQ is important to be able to uh, get into different kind of collegial programs and other kinds of stuff and to learn uh, a very technical or complicated system. But usually what determines whether or not you're successful in life is how well you can read people and how well you can read social situations and how well you can self-manage and emote. Okay? And uh, this is worked on by Daniel Goldman over the past 30 years. And I'm just going to play you a really brief clip from him. Um, is this okay? This is just the first two minutes of it, and I'll stop it. Daniel, you once wrote a famous article on leadership after studying uh, companies like PepsiCo. So can you tell us about that article? Uh, I wrote an article uh, for the Harvard Business Review in 98 uh, called What Makes a Leader? And it was really an extension of a book I just finished called Working with Emotional Intelligence. They wanted to, the, the review asked me to talk about the competencies or abilities that you see in star performing leaders. That article, by the way, has become their number one most requested reprint in the history of the review. It really struck the court. I think it did because it articulated something that people had sensed but not been able to put into words. Basically, what I argued is that there are four kinds of strengths that you see in the best leaders. One is self-awareness. People have uh, the capacity to reflect on themselves, to monitor themselves. And this matters in many ways. One is for making good decisions. It turns out that you need to uh, be able to capture that felt sense of feels right, doesn't feel right, uh, and mix that into the hard data on a business decision or on a life decision. You know, should I, should I keep this job or should I take a risk and, and take another job. That's not a decision you can make a list of pros and cons. You need to have a gut sense because there are uh, ungraspables, things you can't put into words, that actually are important information that part of your brain knows, but only can tell you not in words, but in a gut sense, literally a gut sense. That's the way we want it. So people who make good or better decisions, business leaders, anyone, have this capacity for self-awareness. There's another point that's important, that is as an ethical guide, the answer to the question is what I'm about to do in keeping with my values doesn't come to us in words, it comes to us again in that sense. Then, so, so people are talking a little bit about that, but these are the four, is that helpful at all? Does that ring true to you? That emotional self-management, that self-awareness is one of the most important things as leaders that we have to be able to have, yes. So he says that self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management are the foundational stones upon which we build any kind of uh, leadership decision or leadership training, and the greatest leaders do this quite well. Okay? So, so in some sense I know, coming back to him again, because it's a practical application of his 100 million yen, 
um, is, uh, uh, you know, being the scholar says, well, you know, let me now uh, take an inventory and see how I'm doing. Because he knows that Daniel Goldman has his leadership styles. And so he takes a test, and these are the results. So these are six, the six uh, um, uh, competencies. And this is actually based on the test that he took this week. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. So he found that he was very high in being visionary and being affiliative, medium in being coaching and democratic, and then a little bit lower on two different styles called case setting and commanding or coercive. Okay. Now, this probably doesn't mean very much to you right now, right? Does it mean anything to you? These are just labels and terms, right? So I thought that if it was okay with you, I would try to demonstrate what these would be like. And this may be a little bit goofy, so I'm going to ask you just to bear with me. My acting ability, as you just saw, is really quite terrible. So, um, <laughs> so ready? Okay, we're going to do one. And you're going to tell me which one I'm doing each time, all right? I have a dream. I have a dream of the way communication can be done for every patient throughout Japan. In fact, I know, I know that if people can follow my lead, that we're going to be able to transform Japan from a fundamental point, from the ground up, as we have people connect very deeply, as they work and empathize with each other, as physicians take better care of patients, as nurses come together into teams, we can change the way Japanese society works, and we can make it the best in the world. And in fact, when I do this, when I talk to my team about this, I know that they'll understand it. I'm going to help them. I'm going to be as transparent as I can be, and I'm going to make sure that everybody understands what we're trying to do, why we're trying to do it, and anything I know they will know. I'll help them. We'll work together. And by God, we're going to be the best in the world. What kind of leader am I? Visionary. Visionary, right? So that's visionary. So that's what a visionary leader is like. They try to inspire people. Okay. So let's do someone else. Uh, okay. So that's visionary. A bit better. Okay. <coughs> so, you know, I, I've been leading organizations now for about 15, 20 years. And I, I can tell you that what's most important to me when I'm working together with my team, is to make sure that people really get along. Um, if my team can work together and I can help them understand each other, we can build a great network together, and we'll be able to really, when times are tough, dig in and come together and get things done. I'm gonna make sure that we have team dinners, I'm gonna make sure that we have a good balance of work and play, and I'm gonna get to know each one of my teammates in a very individual way, so that when times are tough, they can come to me. We'll still have a lot of work that we're going to accomplish. We're still going to work very, very hard, but laying that foundation of being a team together and really knowing each other, to me, is what makes leadership work. What kind of leader am I? Coaching. Uh, not coaching. It's close. Coaching is democratic. Huh? Democratic. Uh, not democratic. Affiliated. Okay. The affiliated uh, leader is very concerned uh, to make sure that the team works together and that people, you're paying as much attention to their emotional state as you are to their performance. Because if you can get the team happy and functional together, then they believe that things are going to work well. So these are the two that Tom Sensei is, is best in, right? And you, if you work with him, you know that he does this. Henry Kissinger once said that leadership Leadership is in four shown. Action, passion, decision, vision. That, I like that. That's very good. Yeah, there's, there's lots of theories on leadership, right? So this is only one of them. And, um, and action, ACTA order. Action, cost reduction, topical product, initiative marketing, organizational reactivation, and new managing strength. Oh, I like that. So Panasonic founder. <laughs> That's very cool. See, as I was saying, you know, it's not like I have some great um, uh, hold on the knowledge here. You guys have all been leaders in your own institutions, so you also have quite a, and I feel in some ways guilty being up here. So uh, thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. 
so let me do someone else. I really believe that if I can work with individuals and help them grow, help them meet their own career demands, and help them individually, one by one, get better, um, that I can help them understand how their personal growth and their growth trajectory is going to relate to the mission of the school and the mission of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I'll really pay attention to how people are doing, and I'll help them anytime there's a problem. When things are tough, I expect them to be able to come to me because they know that I'm going to be there for them. Um, and I'm going to work with them wherever they are developmentally to make sure that they reach their own milestones. But in the process, well, the team will come together and we'll reach all of our institutional milestones as well. Who's, who's that? Coaching. It's coaching. Right? Coaching is interested in the individual and interested in um, making sure that everyone's needs are met along the way. Is this helpful at all? I, don't know. Okay, I know it's kind of goofy, so I apologize. Well, I'm a Jewish bioethicist and chairman of the US Prison Council of Bioethics. Leon Kast said, Captain Harry told him, victory over mortality is the unstated but implicit goal of modern medical science. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay, you have to give me your references. And immortality has not been available in the region. I think, I think you are far more eloquent than I am. Um, all right, let's do a, a couple more. So, um, you know, when I work with the team, I have a lot of people who are very experienced around me. And, uh, you know, frankly, I think that it's very important to make sure that everybody's voice is heard um, because I know that I don't have all the answers. Just as you shared your ideas and thoughts with me, I know each person in the room has something to contribute. And if I don't hear from all of you, I know that whatever we develop is going to be suboptimal. Now, sometimes it's a little bit tough when there's varying levels of experience. But, you know, frankly, the people who have the least experience sometimes have the best perspective uh, because they may be closer to the problem than the rest of us. So when I make decisions, I want to make sure that there's consensus and that everybody has a chance to really provide input. Who am I? And then you These dressing changes are not as good as some of my other friends who do these other uh, things quite well. But, all right. I have to tell you that I'm often disappointed in the fact that my team doesn't work nearly as hard as I think they should. Um, I, I expect a lot out of people, I expect a lot out of myself, um, and I do everything I can to make sure that um, I'm setting a great role model and example for everybody. Um, if I need to come in at 2 o'clock in the morning because there's a patient crisis, no problem, I'll do that. If, and I frankly expect everybody else to do the same and not really complain about it. Um, and I don't understand why people don't work as hard as they need to, and sometimes deadlines pass. And um, I will show them how it's done, and I'll show them just by sheer will and example exactly what we need to do together. I'll help them, I'll coach them, I'll bring them along, I'll give them whatever kind of help they need, but I expect performance. Who am I? I'm not commanding. I'm peace setting, right? I am the role model, I am the example, I have the answer, and I am the work product, okay? And um, I expect everybody else to do what I tell them. I expect, I expect everyone else to follow my lead, okay? So, I have to tell you, um, you know, I run uh, at least three different programs, and now I have 100 million yen. Um, and there's, there's so much to accomplish in such a short period of time. Uh, it is critical, it is critical that my group can follow my directions because I, I clearly have a very well thought out way to go. We've had input from a strategic planning committee. We know exactly where we're going. We know exactly what we want to do. But I can tell you 
that I expect my, my, my team to really fall in line and be able to follow the plan as we've developed it. We've done a very thoughtful needs analysis, and I've worked with the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, um, lots of stakeholders. Now it's time for implementation, and we better get this done, get it done on time, and get it done right. And I expect people, when I tell them to do something, to get it done and do it properly. Who am I? I'm commanding, right? I'm coercive, I'm commanding. So the point about these is that all of these are valid leadership styles. Okay? They all will get things done. Now the problem is that um, the last two, pace setting and commanding, um, you'll get stuff done, but everybody will hate you, right? <laughs> now, it's very, very useful under two circumstances. One where there's very clear role definitions with an experienced team, okay, and everybody knows what they're supposed to do. And the second is when you're in times of crisis or emergency. Um, if you have a natural disaster that's happening, a tsunami has hit, okay, or an earthquake has hit, there's not a lot of time for everyone to be debating about you know, the 15 things that I, I should have done last week, or you know, I need this, or I need that. It needs to be about getting the job done. Okay? Uh, in emergency situations, or with a very experienced team that's already worked together for a while, Pace setting and commanding can work under every other circumstance. It will just, people will get the job done, but at the end of it, they will resent you, okay? So these uh, top four are the ones that work in most situations, all right? And they'll even work in an emergency if you know how to do it properly. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's okay, all right. So, um, so the, the point here is that great leaders are adaptable. Hey, you shouldn't have just one style. This is, are you guys familiar with chameleons? Are there chameleons in Japan? Yes? These are little um, uh, reptiles that change their color depending on where they are. They're kind of like octopus in that way. All right. And the, the, the last idea that Son Sensei is dealing with is now he kind of knows himself. Do you know yourself better? Yes, he knows himself very well as a leader. Any thoughts on your leadership style? Uh, not good at commanding. Is that important for you to, to work on? It may, it may or may not be, depending on what situations you put yourself in, right? So the last idea is about leading change. Now, so San Sensei wants to uh, make big changes in his organization. And um, well, organizations can be uh, too big or too complex or too scary, and sometimes it's hard to make changes. But we're going to kind of go over this very briefly, given the fact that we just have a few minutes. Um, but the idea here is that changing complex systems is a very well-studied thing. Okay. Although using my microphone does not seem to be as well-studied. Um, and, you know, when you're changing systems, the business literature shows you that there's lots of things that you can work on. You can work on leadership, management, individuals, you can work on quality improvement, and things along those lines, right? And there's lots of different things that you can use, and tons and tons of different techniques. Some of which, like Kaizen, um, uh, originated in Japan. Uh, actually, a lot of the Malcolm Baldrige um, uh, Six Sigma stuff originated in Japan. Many of these management techniques do. Um, the leadership techniques are really from all over the place. And um, when you start taking a look at them, there's really two ideas I want to share with you. The first one is by John Carter on leading change. And the second one is by Jim Collins on Good to Great for the Social Sectors. And if you haven't read these, has anyone read these? I see. Besides, Judy is it? What is it? Which one? Judy is it? Oh, it's a Plan, Do, Study, Act Cycles. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's stuff by Paul Batalden that he came up with when he was at Dartmouth and then um, when he was working with the Commonwealth Fund. Um, but we can, I can give you references for those. I can give you references. So, um, uh, uh, so Leading Change is kind of a book by Cotter that he wrote about 10, 15, 20 years ago that everybody, that most people who do any leadership stuff have read. And he talks about, you know, when you're trying to create a change, you want to create a sense of urgency, right? Form a very powerful coalition, which he's already done. He's already convinced the dean of the need. He's got money. He's got a coalition of people he's working with. He's created his vision and articulated it quite well. He's communicated it with the group of people around him because he's got the, the funding for it and he's got people on board. And now he's going to start removing obstacles from his path, both cultural, um, physical, personal, um, structural, systematic, to be able to evolve change. 
uh, find a couple things uh, that can demonstrate some short-term wins, and then build on that change and anchor it in the culture. Okay? So unless you anchor change in a culture, it will attenuate, meaning it will extinguish itself and it will go away. Okay? So any change uh, is temporary unless you can find a way of making it stick. And there are lots of techniques that you can do to make it stick. That's the kind of a topic of another talk. The second set of ideas come from uh, Jim Collins, who uh, wrote, uh, so he's a, a social scientist that had asked the question, what makes some companies good, and what makes other companies great? I mean, like, really great, right? Not just kind of a loop. So he did a, a match their case analysis, where he took about 100 companies, he and a ton of his graduate students, and they went along and said, there's some companies that are good, uh, but they're not great. And at some point in time, the, a set of companies uh, just sort of really just skyrocketed into greatness. What did they do differently? And he found they did a couple, they did five things differently. The first thing is they figured out what great meant. What actually was great for them? The second is he, they identified people who had five different types of leadership uh, levels, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, they figured out who should be working on the project, who. So they always say, first who, then what. Having the right people collaborate with you is more important than almost anything else because you can change your focus, you can change a lot of stuff, but your team really matters. Like you guys have been working together, you guys are a very functional team, right? The right person, with the right people by your side, you can get anything done. And then the next thing is this idea of a hedgehog. Uh, do you guys know what a hedgehog is? Have you seen them? They're small little nocturnal animals that have a spiny um, outside. They kind of uh, are outdoors in fields. Okay. So the hedgehog can't do very much, but it can do one thing really well. It can defend itself against predators. And so if you can do one thing really well and focus on that, you're highly likely to succeed. Okay. Uh, and then the next thing is once you have a little bit of momentum, as you have you know, had that early win, really of continue, there's this thing called a flywheel, um, uh, where you just sort of, it kind of just moves upward with a lot of additional rotation. So you move the flywheel up that curve of excellence. Okay. And his stuff actually, when you read a lot of his stuff, it's very Buddhist. Okay. And it's, it sounds very Buddhist because what he says is this. He says that the framework, the input, is you have to have disciplined people, disciplined thought, disciplined action, uh, you need to have the right value system, and a lot of the other things that are part of Buddha's Eightfold Path. Okay. And then you build lasting greatness, and then you have a whole bunch of outputs. But um, uh, the leadership portion is really interesting because we have many people all around us who are highly capable, and then you have some people who will contribute to your team, some people who will be very good at managing and there's no point in having leadership skills without having also some management skills. You've got to be able to get things done. And so you need people who can implement. And managers are wonderful to implement. You have people who are an effective leader, but a great leader has both a sense of humility and a sense of vision. And they can use all these leadership styles to really get things done properly and they can adapt to the situation. Okay? So a level five executive or a level five leader is someone who's pretty highly skilled. And then, um, again, so this hedgehog concept is this. So if you guys know Sonic the Hedgehog, Sega's uh, computer program, right? It's a little video game. Okay. So um, uh, Sonic the Hedgehog has a bunch of spines, right? And so um, uh, in, in English, there's a, a saying called, a fox knows many things, but a hedgehog knows one big thing, okay? So uh, this is like a, an English saying. Is that an English saying? Yes? You've heard this before. It's not, I'm just not making this up. Okay, so if you have a genuine Englishman who's telling us this is the real thing. Okay, and so this is what the hedgehog can do. So it goes from being this cute little fuzzy animal, soft underbelly, defenseless legs, very tasty to you know all kinds of predators, to being this this rolled up spiny thing that anytime you try to attack it is going to all you're going to do is get a fistful of quills. Okay. Um, so the hedgehog concept is a series of good decisions. Do what you're best at, what you're passionate about, and what drives your, your economic or your social engine. Okay? It's different for the social sector than it is for non for for profits. Am I going backwards? Okay. Um, he has a couple other things about uh, disciplined action. 
um, on, you know, make sure that you're planning for succession. You can't have your entire organization built upon a culture of one, right? You see many people, uh, like the past law firm spends with Elon Musk, um, who is a kind of a celebrity entrepreneur. Um, so despite the fact that he's a celebrity entrepreneur and he uses a celebrity for Tesla and his electronic car to be able to get a lot of people interested, he actually has a very good management team. And if he was to go, there might not be as much flair and personality, but the company would not fall apart. He's done very good succession planning. Okay? And then uh, preserving the core. So this is when you're, when you're really trying to accelerate. Okay, one of the things that you want to do is dream big, right? Don't dream about the small program, dream about the big program. Have big, hairy, audacious goals. So this is a term that he developed, big, hairy, audacious goals. And you think big and don't be afraid to go after them. Just make sure you're doing it in a way that can actually get you there. Okay? So don't be afraid of having vision. And so really what we want to do is make sure that someone can say uh, now is prepared and has the tools to lead. And then at the end, he's going to be able to accomplish everything he wants. Okay, and that's it.